The years 1861 to 1865 were the most traumatic and tragic of our nation's history. It was a time of unparalleled human drama in which virtually every American, from the president to the humblest private, played a role in shaping the future of their country. So deep were the divisions of that house divided, that friend fought friend and brother fought brother to settle once and forever questions left unanswered by the founding fathers. Those four bloody years of civil war claimed 620,000 lives and seared the American mind and soul for a century thereafter. For the survivors of that terrible war, the scars, both physical and spiritual, would last a lifetime. And yet, with passing decades, time eased the painful memories of the trying march of inadequate rations, wasting illness, and the horrors of the battlefield. As the war faded into myth and memory, the aging veterans in blue and gray looked past the suffering and hardship, distilling their shared experience into a heritage of heroic deeds of devotion, duty, and honor that they hoped would ennoble future generations of an America reunited. Above all, the veterans wished their service and sacrifice to be remembered. And as they marched with thinning ranks into a new century, the invention of the newsreel camera enabled technology to record their moving image, their faces and voices, allowing us to remember them as something more than a stilted pose, a bronze statue, or a name on a marble headstone. In 1887, it occurred to prolific inventor Thomas Alva Edison that he could make an instrument that would do for the eye what his phonograph had done for the ear. He created Edison's projecting kinetoscope, a machine that projected a moving image on a screen. Edison recorded scenes of daily life in the America of the 1890s, including what may be the earliest motion picture recordings of veterans of the war between the states. Although the great conflict had been over for three decades, its experiences remained in the minds and souls of those who had served. For the remainder of their lives, these survivors would perpetuate the memories of fallen comrades and the legacy of their own heroic deeds. The proud old men who once had worn the blue and gray looked beyond the commemoration of past glories to a time when no veterans would remain to tell of Bull Run, of Shiloh, of Antietam, of Gettysburg. The experience of war forged a brotherhood that transcended politics, loyalties, divisions. When the veterans returned to the peaceful fields, once strewn with the wreck and carnage of battle, Yank and Reb stood side by side, Americans. The ceremonies attending the dedication of the Pennsylvania Monument at Petersburg, May 19, 1909, was one such occasion. Old animosities were forgotten. Perhaps General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, himself a battle-scarred survivor of Petersburg, put it best when he wrote, What wonder that men who passed through such things together should be wrought upon by that strange power of a common suffering, which so divinely passes into the power of a common love. Ultimately vanquished in battle, the proud veterans of the Southern Confederacy marched down through the decades with spirits unbroken. It is all the better that the war was fought, even though our cause went down in defeat, one Southern veteran said. The struggle has left a heritage of brave deeds, a history of heroic endurance, of fidelity to country and home and fireside for the whole American nation, North and South, to cherish.
America's splendid little war with Spain in 1898 further unified the people of North and South. Not content to sit idly by as America entered an exciting age of national expansion, this time the blue and gray would fight side by side under one flag. Former Confederate Cavalry General Joseph Wheeler, a West Point graduate of 1859, had fought at Shiloh, Murfreesboro, and Atlanta. Wounded three times, 16 horses had been shot from under him. Now he donned a blue uniform to lead American troops in Cuba. In this rare film clip, we see a diminutive Joe Wheeler conferring with Secretary of War Russell A. Alger, himself a former colonel in George Custer's Michigan Cavalry Brigade. Another old Confederate who now wore Yankee blue was Fitzhugh Lee, the rollicking cavalier who rode with Jeb Stewart and a nephew of Robert E. Lee. On New Year's Day, 1899, Fitz Lee led an American parade through the streets of Havana. The field commander of U.S. forces in Cuba was portly General William R. Shafter. Shafter had received the Congressional Medal of Honor for gallantry at the Battle of Fair Oaks. After the Civil War, Pecos Bill Shafter battled Indians on the southwestern frontier. A former store clerk turned lieutenant in the 22nd Massachusetts, Nelson A. Miles emerged from the war a 25-year-old Major General. He bore the scars of four wounds, Fair Oaks, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Petersburg. In the 1870s and 80s, Miles became the most successful Indian fighter in the Army, so successful that he rose to the very top, General-in-Chief. Miles delighted in military pomp and pageantry, and even after his retirement could be seen riding at the head of 20th century soldiers. In October 1917, the blue and gray revisited the once shell-torn, now peaceful battlefield at Vicksburg. The memorials they erected embodied something more than regimental pride and the memory of fallen comrades. The obelisks of granite and statues of bronze were not just a tribute to the past, they were an appeal to future generations. These monuments shall last, said former Confederate General William Bate, and through all the coming years shall inspire our remotest descendants with the loyalty to conviction which these fields illustrate. A spectator at the 1903 reunion of Civil War veterans declared, the world will never see their like again. And as their ranks diminish, the reverence felt for the survivors will increase. As America began a new century and entered the modern age, the graying survivors of the bloodiest war gathered in fraternal reunion on the fields where so many comrades had fallen. Once again, they shared the humble confines of a canvas tent and stood in line to dine on simple soldier's fare. One old rebel eating with a friendly Yankee was heard to remark, we have broken bread together. I do not call this a meal. 
I call it a sacrament. The reunion at Gettysburg in the summer of 1913 marked the 50th anniversary of the greatest battle ever fought on American soil. At the famous stone wall where they had once locked in combat, the old men now shook hands. It was the largest gathering of Union and Confederate veterans since the war. Some 55,000 were in attendance. Their average age, 72. Their mutual spirit of reconciliation was noted by Joseph Leathers, a wounded veteran of the Stonewall Brigade. We cannot forget the memories of the past or the cause for which we fought and bled and so many of our comrades died. These memories are a part of our lives, but it does not take away from the love of our common country or the glory and the valor of American manhood, no matter on which side it was displayed. Former Yanks and Rebs, now content to be plain Americans, tented under canvas one more time, swapped yarns with their pards, and toured the hallowed ground of Gettysburg. Some, like this Confederate first sergeant, displayed battle-torn relics of their wartime service. Only one of the battle's senior commanders was still alive in 1913. 93-year-old Major General Daniel Sickles, commander of the Union Third Corps. A colorful character, fond of whiskey, women, and cigars, Dan Sickles' unauthorized movement of his corps on the second day of the battle remains one of Gettysburg's great controversies. The general's right leg, if not his reputation, was a casualty of the battle. Some of the most significant wartime innovations took place in the field of naval technology. One of these, the emergence of the ironclad warship. The USS Canonicus, one of the Union's fleet of monitors, had seen action on the James River and at Fort Fisher. In 1907, a review of Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet included the Canonicus, still in service, one of the last of the ironclad monitors. Not long after the war, the veterans established fraternal organizations dedicated to the care of crippled and destitute comrades, aiding the widows and orphans of those who had died in service and perpetuating the legacy of their own deeds of valor. The largest such veterans organization was the Grand Army of the Republic. With a peak membership of 425,000, the GAR became a powerful political lobby wielding its considerable clout on behalf of Union veterans' benefits. Three of its members would become presidents of the United States.
gathered at their annual national encampments, the faces and military bearing of these old men reflected their pride in having served their country well. Still hale and hearty, they wore their medals and corps insignia, some their wartime uniforms, and four years of drill at the Manual of Arms was not forgotten. years after Appomattox included veterans of the U.S. regulars, the Vermont Brigade, and the Fighting Irish Brigade, sporting sprigs of green in their hats. a new element to film, sound. All right, sir. General Stevens, it's a pleasure to greet you, sir, as the incoming commander of the United Confederate Veterans of America. General Sneed, I thank you for your kindness and your appreciation. this rare film clip, we see the daring southern horseman who had followed the hard-riding, hard-fighting Nathan Bedford Forrest, the untutored military genius dubbed a wizard of the saddle. In New York City, the annual Memorial Day Parade on Riverside Drive included veterans of some of New York's most famous regiments. <laughs> All right, let's go. We are the veterans of the Civil War, 61 to 65. This flag 
is of the hunting zoos, New York. Now salute. Thanks very much. I'll take it on over. So you can do it. Hey, you. battle-torn, blood-stained regimental colors passed in solemn review. The, the convention decided not to approve the joint reunion. And the reunion will be next year at uh, Montgomery, Alabama. It is, but we will hold a reunion so long as there are two veterans left to hold it. Thank you, sir, as a native of my native state, Mississippi, whom we all love and honor, and will do so until the last day. Richard Alexander Sneed, commanding general of the UCV, at age 16 had joined the 18th Mississippi of Barksdale's brigade. He fought through the war with that famous command, and in May 1863, as Boxdale's men defended Fredericksburg in a second bloody battle, Sneed was severely wounded. He recovered, rose to the rank of sergeant, and was captured at the Battle of Sailor's Creek three days before the surrender at Appomattox. And to wear the crown of the The reunion of the Confederate veterans in my native state on the sea coast of the land of my birth. I love my native state as I do my country. God bless Mississippi. Fine, sir. Fine. Fine. It's an rebellion now. Yes, more people here, and they treat me this like. And did you ever see as many pretty girls? No, I never did. Did you hear that there pretty woman talking? Yeah. Uh, bagging on the old soldier? You, I wanted to hug her, oh, and but I couldn't get to her. You tell her to hold on that you, you wanted to have a word with her. Well, I'll, next time I see her, I'll fix it all up. All right. I'm going to hunt her up, too, this evening. Maybe she may be up here this evening. Well, she'll be here. Uh, the old girl is gone, you won't get to see her. No. What are you going to do about it? I'll hunt another one. I don't think you'd find out another as crazy as that one. Oh. I was going to tell you, when I was a little boy, they used to wear long dresses. Some of them three of red backs on them. And then they uh, commenced wearing them big, like, sort of like this little lady here. And then they commenced cutting them off. They were cutting them off until they got them way up here. And you never saw the other side in your life. <laughs> <laughs>
We are the last of the old bodyguards of our masters served through the war between the states. And we have been to all the reunions and they have treated us just the same as any other soldier. I'm Mama Duke, Joe Shelmer, bodyguard. Done everything they told me to do. And uh, so one day, Mama Duke, General Mama Duke told me to go and get some chickens. I told him I didn't know what's going on. He said, I've got his gun. Look like them red chaps on there. I told him, yes, sir, I, I'll go right now. <laughs> well, you ought to know how old I am? Yeah. I'll be 81 years old the first day in August. Damn Wednesday. Been to the southern white man, my race would have been in the jumps of Africa today. Ignorant as in the wild beast. He brought me over here and made a human out of me. Birds, we had a band at our country by the name of Bossett. He was a great hand to go out and forage. So we come in one day with a chicken. Now the man, he, the man that he took the chicken from come in and reported it. And now he says, Bossett, the captain says, Martin, you were under arrest for three days. Sergeant, take him to the guardhouse. So we took him to the guardhouse and put him upstairs. That's all the guardhouse that we had at that time. And uh, the second day he was in there, when he got his feet, he crumbled his hard tack down, got, got the loop down, and pretty soon the pigs come around. And you know, they, uh, looped, he stepped in the loop, and the pigs went to climbing right up the side of the house. And come in, and the man comes down, and he says, Oh, my, Lieutenant, let that man out. He's now stealing my pigs. So they let him out. <laughs> That's all right. Huh? Come on, hey, hey. <laughs> We had a man in the service, and he was, he was picking those things off <laughs> of his pants, you know. And uh, come along, and uh, say, uh, those arithmetic bugs that we have. Now, yeah. why do you call them arithmetic bugs? Arithmetic bugs. The reason why you call them arithmetic bugs is this: they add to my, my, uh, they add to my discomfort, they subtract from my pleasure, and they multiply like H. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. Well, so the day came along, and you saw Mike. I've taken the graybacks out of the seams of his pants. So he says, uh, Mike, I see you're picking them out. No, but Jaber says, Mike, I'm, Mike, I'm taking them as I, they come. <laughs> <laughs> Regiment, in marching down in Virginia, one day we came through a portion of the country where the people were in sympathy with the Union cause. And the colonel of our regiment that morning on our march, he said, no, I don't want any, any, anyone to leave their regiment and to go out and pick up things that don't belong to us. And they were marching along finally, and uh, the colonel at the head of the regiment on his horse, he looked back, and there was a man, a uh, hog squealing. And he looked back and he saw a man sitting straddle of that, of uh, that hog, holding his hog's ears, holding him down. The colonel rode back there and he said, look here. Didn't you hear the order this morning? There should be no foraging? Yes, sir. Well, see, what are you doing here? Well, he says, Colonel, I come down here to fight the rebels, and I'll be darned if I'm going to let a hog run over me. <laughs> the 75th anniversary of Gettysburg in 1938 was a far different event than the 50th anniversary. 25 years had thinned the ranks of veterans and slowed their step. Now only 2,000 old soldiers were in attendance. Their average age, 92. It was the last great reunion of the blue and gray.
times had changed. America had entered the modern age, and the cavalry that paraded through Gettysburg in 1938 was mechanized. President Roosevelt spoke at the crowning ceremony of the 75th anniversary, the dedication of the Eternal Peace Light Memorial. Men who wore the blue and men who wore the gray are here together, FDR said, a fragment spared by time. As each soldier answered the final roll call, those who remained honored their loved comrades with simple but moving tributes, as with the funeral of James Buckley, a farmer who had marched off to war with the 4th Pennsylvania Reserves. The survivors were all too aware of their own mortality, but as always, preserved their pride, their gentle dignity. We offer up this lowly grave alone. May future generations emulate the unselfish devotion of the lowliest of our heroes. Thank you. For the symbol of victory. Captain. Captain. In behalf of the Grand Republic, for whose unity and integrity our comrade James Buckley of the 4th Pennsylvania offered his services during the War of the Rebellion, I most reverently place the flag of the United States upon his cast. The march of another comrade is over. And after it, he lies down in the house appointed for all the living. Thus summon <coughs> these funeral obsequies remind us of the frailty of human life and the tenure by which we hold our own. In such an hour, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It seems for him, as it did in great love, when he pitched his tent, or when William put so he lay down with us. So faithful in our remaining marches that we should be ready to fall out and take our places in the great review hereafter, not with doubt, but with faith, the merciful captain of our salvation will call us to that fellowship which upon earth and in heaven remains unbroken. Second hymn. We seek thee with whom there is no death. Open every eye to behold him who hath changed the night of death into morning. In the depths of our hearts we would hear the celestial word I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. As comrade after a comrade departs, and we march on with ranks broken, help us to be faithful to thee and to each other. We beseech thee to look with compassion upon the widows and children of deceased comrades who save our country with the freedom and peace of righteousness and through thine own mercy the Savior's grace and thy Holy Spirit's favor may we all meet at last with joy before thy throne in heaven and to thy great name shall be praised forever and ever. Amen. We shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one day conscious. We 
parading with jaunty tread, now shambling with halting step. Bent with age, the last veterans marched onward to their final rest, a time when the last campfire would be extinguished, the last tent struck. Finally, one veteran remained, Walter Williams of Texas. Frail of body, his eyes filled with memories and tears, he was the last of the brave soldiers of the Southern Confederacy. Walter Williams, who claimed to be the last survivor of the Civil War, shown here on his 112th birthday, is dead at the age of 117. His passing symbolically closes a great and tragic era of American history. Gone is the last man who could speak from memory of the millions of wearers of the blue and the gray who participated in that mighty and terrible clash that split our country a century ago. ceremonies in Houston and the eloquent messages from national leaders mourn not only Walter Williams, one time forge master with Hood's Texas Cavalry, but all who took part in whatever degree in the war between the states. The veterans are gone now to their final encampment, but their pride their courage, their dignity, and their love of country are an eternal reminder and an eternal challenge to us and to future generations. What we should cherish from the example of these grand old men was perhaps best expressed by Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great Supreme Court Justice, thrice wounded veteran of the 20th Massachusetts. Through our great good fortune, in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. It was given to us to learn at the outset that life is a profound and passionate thing. While we are permitted to scorn nothing but indifference and do not pretend to undervalue the worldly rewards of ambition, we have seen with our own eyes beyond and above the gold fields, the snowy heights of honor. And it is for us to bear the report to those who come after us. But, above all, we have learned that whether a man accepts from fortune her spade and will look downward and dig, or from aspiration her axe and cord and will scale the ice, 
the one and only success which it is his to command is to bring to his work a mighty heart. On the occasion of receiving the degree of Doctor of Laws from Yale University, Justice Holmes spoke of the power of honor to bind men's lives. He said, if it does not lift a man on wings to the sky, at least it carries him above the earth and teaches him those high and secret pathways across the branches of the forest, the travelers on which are only less than winged. You have done all that a university can do to fan the spark in me. I will try to maintain the honor you have bestowed. And how marvelously he has done so through the nearly 50 years which have passed since then. Justice Holmes will now speak to you from Washington, D.C. <coughs> in this symposium, my part is only to sit in silence to express one's feelings as the end draws near is too intimate a task. But I may mention one thought that comes to me as a listener in. The riders in a race do not stop short when they reach the goal. There is a little finishing canter before coming to a standstill. There is time to hear the kind voice of friends and to say to oneself, the work is done. But just as one says that, the answer comes, the race is over, but the work never is done while the power to work remains. The canter that brings you to a standstill need not be only coming to rest. It cannot be while you'll still live, but to live is to function. That is all there is in living. And so I end with a line from a Latin poet who uttered the message more than 1,500 years ago. Death, death plucks my ear and says, live, I am coming. Thank you, Mr. Justice. We now return you to the New York studio. <laughs> echo of the marching feet of 61 is being heard in Springfield as 1,200 Civil War veterans celebrate their 66th annual reunion. <laughs> Women folk help to guide those with whom the spirit is more willing than their faltering limbs. Oh, 
Although their ranks are dwindling and the thin blue line grows smaller every year, there are still some left with young ideas. They were a living testament to the great deeds of the past. They had witnessed great battles, had suffered and endured on fields of unprecedented carnage, places imbued by chance and fate with a great and terrible immortality. They had lived when dear comrades died, lived to tell of the bloody angle, the sunken road, the hornet's nest, that these men had willingly faced and endured such things together and persisted through the slaughter had much to do with duty and discipline and honor. But it had a great deal more to do with an abiding love for their country, of ideals they valued more than life itself. The Civil War was the fiery crucible of our history, all the more terrible for its inevitability. Brother drew sword on brother, and when those four bloody years were ended, more than 600,000 Americans lay buried in the soil of their youth. In the decades that followed the great war between the states, the ties that bonded the survivors were strengthened by the formation of two great veterans' organizations. In the South, the United Confederate Veterans. In the North, the Grand Army of the Republic. Though time steadily thinned the ranks of the UCV and GAR, the members of those fraternities of blue and gray remained undaunted by the infirmities of age as they sought to honor and perpetuate the ageless glories of the boys of 61. That's what they say. Our hair's turning fast to grey. Our steps are not so best confined as they were when we was twenty-nine. But the wrinkles on our face show clear. They've been there now, boys, for many a year. The GAR and UCV met every year at their respective national encampments. The veterans would conduct their business, elect new officers, and spend hours with old comrades reminiscing about the triumphs and tragedies of their soldier youth. Although partisan hatred faded with the passage of time, sectional pride remained strong, and until the turn of the century, joint blue and gray reunions were rare. The veterans of both armies, ensured by their separate Memorial Day observances, that the fallen soldiers would be remembered. In declaring the 30th of May, the GAR's Memorial Day, Commander-in-Chief John A. Logan proclaimed, if other eyes grow dull and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain in us. Often, the old soldiers would turn out in faded uniforms, braving the heat of summer or chill of winter to keep alive the imperishable legacy of their deeds. When French Marshal Foch toured the United States at the end of World War I, he visited a UCV contingent within the old Confederate earthworks that had once guarded Richmond, Virginia. For the youth of America, too, the grand old men were not forgotten.
Dixieland, the Old South. It's the 47th reunion of the Confederate veterans. They grow fewer and fewer. At Jackson, Mississippi, only 200 attend. But a soldier of Lee still can dance with the girl. One thing will still make his old feet go, and that's Dixie. On he dances, as long as he can. Army of the Republic, grand in historic memory, but fading away in the numbers that march. GAR encampment at Madison, Wisconsin, and fewer than 200 of the boys in blue. There's Governor Phil La Follette of Wisconsin. These Union veterans will join Confederate veterans in the 75th anniversary celebration of Gettysburg, the blue and the gray, next summer. But they protest against the Confederate flag. They still have pep and still can fight the Civil War. Civil War veterans fight it over. Thinning ranks of old men parade with brave front. At Portland, do you remember when? <laughs> what do you think of the style of the young women nowadays, Captain? All right. <laughs> well, and uh, the, when the battle opened up in the wilderness, a lot of his old schoolmates and friends come flying back to the rear, and he says, what in the hell and damnation are you running so far? He says, simply because we can't fly. <laughs> As we run into Grant, or Grant run into us. <laughs> the stalwart boys in gray, now aging but vigorous grandfathers, treasured the heartfelt legacy of the lost cause and found joy in the celebration of that never-to-be-forgotten time. General John B. Gordon, the first commander-in-chief of the UCV, stressed the patriotic duty of his organization. The UCV will cherish the past glories of the dead Confederacy, Gordon said, and transmute them into living inspirations for future service to the living republic. The leadership of the United Confederate Veterans included dignified old warriors like Richard A. Sneed of Mississippi, Charles Alfred de Saucer of Memphis, Tennessee, and Leonard Waller Stevens, a soft-spoken veteran of Company A, 27th Louisiana Infantry. Commander in Chief, the United Confederate Veterans. You want me to reply? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I greatly appreciate your congratulations and your and good your wishes. Is that, is that enough or is you the one to say? Or what do you want me to say? The general? The general. No, you. Me? Uh, general Leonard Stevens, I want to congratulate you upon your election as commander in chief of the United Confederate Veterans, and I wish you a successful administration. I thank you. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I want to say furthermore that in the name of the Confederate veterans, we thank you for your noble efforts toward giving us this royal welcome that we've had here. All right. With his white mustache and goatee, Charles de Saucer looked the epitome of the Southern Colonel. His father, a South Carolina plantation owner, was a Confederate surgeon. De Saucer enlisted at age 16 and helped man the guns of the Beaufort Volunteer Artillery at the battles of Honey Hill and Bentonville. Harry Rene Lee, seen here in his distinctive white uniform, served with the 34th Mississippi at Perryville, Chickamauga, Lookout Mountain, and in the Atlanta Campaign. His post-war career included a stint in the British Navy during the war with Egypt.
Homer T. Atkinson was a lifelong resident of Petersburg, Virginia. Joining the 19th Mississippi, Homer Atkinson was among the gallant defenders of Fort Gregg, a Confederate bastion that bore the brunt of the final Yankee onslaught at Petersburg, April 2nd, 1865. When he died in 1945, Atkinson was one of the last six surviving officers of the Civil War. John M. Claypool of the 12th Tennessee was wounded at Stones River, Chickamauga, and Franklin, where he planted his unit's banner on the Yankee works. This steadfast old warrior, ever ready to honor the memory of Jefferson Davis and the Southern Confederacy, died in 1945 of a broken heart, it was said, when a promised vehicle failed to arrive in time to take him to the annual Memorial Day celebrations. In New York City's annual Memorial Day Parade, survivors of Gettysburg and the Wilderness marched with the veterans of San Juan Hill and Chateau Thierry. In the 1932 parade, there was even a contingent of German World War I vets. The blue-clad GIR was always a conspicuous part of the festivities, living relics of a distant past. Charles Earl of the Hawk and Zouaves was a yearly fixture in the New York parade one of the last survivors of those exotically uniformed warriors of the Union. The group of GAR men attracted the attention of a zealous newsreel reporter. <laughs> All right, let's go. Oh, is that another one? Yeah, not that. Start it bigger. See what? Start it in now. Sad. You have the same thing again? <coughs> we are the veterans of the Civil War, 61 to 65. And this is the flag of the uh, Hawkins Zouave. Their spokesman, the Reverend Walter Hammond, had left his studies at Harvard University to become a sergeant in the 47th Massachusetts Volunteers. Another New York veteran was William Henry Jackson, whose wartime service in the Vermont Brigade was eclipsed by his later fame as one of the great photographers of the Western Frontier. In May 1865, the armies of the Union marched triumphantly through Washington. Fifty years later, the men of the GAR, 20,000 strong, retraced the route of the Grand Review. Memories of that earlier review were still fresh in the minds of the aging soldiers, who by 1915 were dying at a rate of 34,000 per year. But as in 1865, the sadness was far outweighed by the joy they felt in the familiar beat of drum, the cadenced step, and the cheers of a quarter of a million spectators. One old Yank, George G. Burlingame, still sported the uniform he had worn as a soldier in the 1st Massachusetts Heavy Artillery. His musket still held a round he had loaded in 1865. In its barrel he carried a sign that read, As I marched down this avenue 50 years ago.
As in 1865, the historic avenue echoed with hoofbeat and marching tread, the blood-stained banners of famous regiments proudly borne. the old guard of Washington, D.C. A drill team of Union veterans marched in colorful tailcoats and bearskin shakos. As they had once passed President Andrew Johnson, so now the tattered colors and proud defenders of the Union filed past President Woodrow Wilson. Beside him in the reviewing stand, the parade's Grand Marshal four times wounded Civil War veteran and retired General and Chief of the U.S. Army, Nelson A. Miles. The most striking feature of the parade was a huge American flag, 150 feet long, weighing half a ton, the largest banner in the world, carried by 117 G.A.R. men of the William McKinley Post of Canton, Ohio. Intertwined with the veterans' memories of camp and battlefield was an abiding love for music. Stirring and sentimental tunes still had the power to evoke martial spirit, a sprightly dance, laughter and tears and the undying zest for life that these old men carried forever in their youthful hearts. While their determination never faded and their fervent patriotism remained undimmed, with the passage of time, the veterans' steps grew halting, their bodies frail. Many were too infirm to participate in the yearly parades and watched sadly from the sidelines. Each year, their numbers were smaller.
A proud old cavalryman might still ride a horse, but as the years went by, the old soldiers were inevitably compelled to ride in automobiles, despite their frequent protests. Fewer were able to march unaided. Technological advancement saw new armies take the field with deadly new instruments of destruction. With their deeply rooted experience of soldiering, many Civil War veterans displayed an eager curiosity in the latest military technology as America girded for a Second World War. Their numbers rapidly diminishing, stalwart spirits at last bowing to remorseless time. In 1938, the men of the Union and the Confederacy prepared for a last great reunion, the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Ailing and bent with age, many confined to wheelchairs, the fragment of the blue and gray mustered on that hallowed ground. More than 160,000 soldiers fought at Gettysburg, but only 65 who actually took part in the offensive returned for the reunion. The average age of all the veterans in camp in 1938 was 94, but they had lots of fun in boasting of their health and strength. It was an unforgettable event the climax of their long service. One last chance to visit with old comrades, to joke and reminisce, and to share the legacy of their deeds with new generations. One of the most interesting camera subjects was Mr. William H. Jackson, a volunteer in Stannard's Vermont Brigade. Soon after the war, he became the pioneer photographer of the then unknown Far West and was first to record the wondrous beauties of Yellowstone Park. During various Civil War campaigns, Mr. Jackson made now invaluable sketches of important battles and historic areas. And how the words did fly. These aged but talkative vet stories of tempestuous maneuvers and sallies. 
probably much in the style of the Union General Hancock's account of Lee's costly attack on Cemetery Ridge. And everybody was all ears when they told of events associated with monuments and areas now in Gettysburg National Military Park. Glimpses of that poignant gathering at Gettysburg were preserved by newsreels and home movies that carried the memories of a heroic age into an uncertain future. The most impressive ceremony at the Gettysburg reunion was the unveiling of the Peace Light Memorial, an event attended by many dignitaries, among them President Franklin Roosevelt. Curious and reverent, tens of thousands gathered to watch the solemn commemorations. Veterans of the blue and the gray. The United States, I accept this monument in the spirit of brotherhood and peace.
few spectators were on hand for a humbler but far more moving event. At the famous stone wall on Cemetery Ridge, where on July 3rd, 1863, the high tide of the Confederacy had thundered against General Hancock's Second Corps, a handful of veterans, blue and gray, met once more, this time in peace where clubbed musket and bayonet once beat and slashed in bloody confrontation. Now, hands were outstretched and grasped in fraternal comradeship. This handshake across the wall had been a feature of earlier reunions. Then, as now, it was a heartfelt ritual that more clearly than any other ceremony personified the mutual admiration and respect of Yank and Reb born of their common love of America. <laughs> At last, the inevitable end drew near. The gallant armies, now but a shadow, gnarled and stooped with age awaiting the last bugle call. The tap of canes and the gentle creak of crutches kept pathetic time to the blare of marching tunes and the clank of arms. The old feet shuffled and faltered in a way which showed that their march was nearly over. And there were many tears. Reduced to a mere handful, the veterans' organizations held their last reunions their spirits strong, though their bodies were weak. The Grand Army of the Republic still lives in the undying spirit of these ten aged and feeble veterans. All New York could muster for Memorial Day, 1939. There aren't many left now. The youngest here is 91, America's oldest living hero. On August 30th, 1949, the 83rd and final meeting of the GAR was held at Indianapolis. The six frail centenarians voted to disband the once mighty legion that at its peak numbered more than 400,000. Albert Henry Wilson, veteran of the 1st Minnesota Heavy Artillery, was the last of these stalwart Union soldiers. When he died on August 2, 1956, President Eisenhower said, His passing brings sorrow to the hearts of all of us who cherish the memory of the brave men on both sides of the war between the states. The United Confederate veterans lived up to the vow made decades earlier by Commander-in-Chief Stevens. But we will hold a reunion so long as there are two veterans left to hold it. A five-day celebration at Norfolk, Virginia marks the final reunion of the United Confederate veterans. It's the 61st encampment of ranks of the gray, and only three of the 12 survivors of the South's gallant host could be on hand to recall the embattled days. All three are 105, but like William D. Townsend of Ola, Louisiana, are spry for their years. Joe Soling, here of Virginia, took his first airplane flight to attend the reunion, as did W.J. Bush, who flew in from his home at Fitzgerald, Georgia.
revered as living symbols of a bygone era. At heart, they were still just boys in gray. No veteran more eloquently defined the abiding spiritual lessons of our war between the states than did Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Colonel of the 20th Maine, Brevet Major General and recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. In a speech he gave to the veterans gathered on the battlefield of Gettysburg, Joshua Chamberlain expressed the enduring message of those gallant soldiers north and south who had fought so bravely for ideals they cherished more strongly than life itself. No chemistry of frost or rain, no overlaying mold of the season's recurrent life and death can ever separate from the soil of these consecrated fields the lifeblood so deeply co-mingled and incorporate here. Ever henceforth under the rolling suns, when these hills are touched to splendor with the morning light, or smile a farewell to the lingering day, the flush that broods upon them shall be rich with a strange and crimson tone, not of the earth, nor yet of the sky, but mediator and hostage between the two. In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate ground for the vision place of souls and reverent men and women from afar and generations that know us not and that we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. And lo, the shadow of a mighty presence shall wrap them in its bosom, and the power of the vision pass into their souls. <laughs> 